Really delighted to be uh, moderating this conversation between uh, these three tremendous speakers this evening, and I'll introduce them. A few housekeeping notes. We're going to hear from each one of them individually, so I'll introduce them up front, but I, I trust that you'll remember who the three of them are. And then we'll retreat over here and, and have a conversation where we can expand a little bit um, and have some back and forth and some more um, meaningful engagement. And then uh, a reception uh, upstairs at the end of the evening. And we will also have time for Q&A. And I think that you will probably have things you want to ask these folks. So um, I will make sure we have time for that. Uh, but let me say that if you're not familiar with the new food economy, which is um, the online magazine that I am the editor of, we are, as Betty said, a staff of um, eight reporters and editors. We're based here in New York City, and our job full time is to cover the forces shaping how and what America eats. And as you can imagine, we do an awful lot of reporting about rural communities and what is happening in rural communities. And we do that very often from our desks in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, across the street from Rockefeller Center. So over the four years that we've been publishing, we have done a lot of thinking about what it means to expand the conversation between beyond small, large, rural, megacity, um, and how to kind of rethink our, our language um, that we use to talk about those things and our relationships to those places. So it's not just farm community and major food producers on the East Coast, and it's not just small scale or industrial agriculture. And so the best conversations and the ones that we uh, do the most of on our pages are the places right in the middle of all of that, where there's a whole lot more nuance and a whole lot more to be considered. So I, I think that's part of what we'll get into uh, here tonight. And so let me introduce, please, and I should say, you can find us at newfoodeconomy.org. We publish every day and a twice weekly free newsletter that gives you a roundup of everything you need to know and need to be reading uh, if you care about food and ag. Um, so it's my great pleasure to have with me, and this will be in order of speaking, uh, Richard McCarthy, a member and international executive committee member, sorry, of Slow Food International, and Suyoshi Sekihara, the founder of Kamiechigo Yamazato Fan Club and Janet Topolsky, Executive Director, uh, Community Strategies Group at the Aspen Institute. So I will see all of you up here when you're done with your time. Thanks. Konbonwa. Hajimaimashite. Richard Des. Yurushku onegojimas. And with that, I will move to a language I can sometimes master uh, in English. Um, very excited for this um, gathering this evening. Um, I first met um, Siyoshi Sakihara here at the Japan Society, but it was when I walked in his community in, um, in uh, Nagata Prefecture, in the mountains, um, that I really understood his um, ideas, which are built on practice, um, built on, uh, I think, the, the sort of uh, alignment of what he does with his hands as a woodworker, um, with his heart, his belief in, in the rural community and its beauty, and with his head. And as a practitioner, um, what I discovered were ideas that were both very original and very familiar. And that's what excited me and why I'm so excited to share it with those of us here in North America. Now, Niigata is in the, uh, Niigata is in, on the Sea of Japan, um, very far away from Tokyo, and uh, is very much off the beaten path. And his community is one of the uh, small rural villages and a collection of rural villages that are part of Joetsu. And very much part of this conversation about rural decline, if not rural collapse, and the aging population and the um, uh, retreat of social services and infrastructure for rural communities. <clears throat> and the practice that he will run us through is robust and holistic and something that excited me because I heard echoes of who our other speaker this evening is Janet Topolsky works with in rural America and I think that it is exciting for rural America and rural Japan to connect. In some of the terms that he brings I just want to run you through because they stuck with me and I think they're part of the Japanese discourse that we don't have necessarily here in the US. So you see sort of the distance of, of where, where, where we will be visiting tonight. And then there are terms 
um, demographic terms that are very much part of discussion in Japan that I think would, we would welcome to have here. And they talk about an I-turn, a J-turn, and a U-turn. And the I-turn would be if you go to a place, you bring your expertise, your knowledge to that place. You impose it and land in that place. Uh, the squad program, the youth corps that is, um, I think, important in recent Japanese um, efforts to revitalize are very much an eye turn. There, there are pros and cons of just plopping yourself in a new place. Do you understand that place? You bring new ideas. How do you fit with that, that new place? The U-turn tends to be a sad one. Um, I think of this as I grew up in New Orleans, went away, and when I came back, I made a U-turn to New Orleans, and people said, why are you coming back here? It's often a sign of failure or, or um, uh, restrictions. And um, so there is the I-turn, there's the U-turn, and then there's this really interesting demographic um, uh, turn, which they refer to as the J-turn. So you start in a small place, you maybe go to the big city, as um, Sayoshi did in, Japan, in, in Tokyo, and have a great professional success, burn out, but don't go back home to where you have to coordinate and maneuver through existing uh, structures of, of um, uh, power structures, having to explain why you're back home. You go someplace near home and like home, and that's the J-turn. And that is something that um, uh, I've observed wherever I've traveled, in Japan and elsewhere, that those who make the J-turn seem to be able to balance effectiveness, familiarity, without being um, uh, restricted by the U-turn. One of the other ideas that caught my attention was the idea of autonomous communities, autonomy. Um, I first got very excited about it because I love autonomous communities. I think of Spanish anarchists and my eyes lit, lit up. And, and the more I, I, I listened to, to the ideas, it's a very specific idea of autonomy. Autonomous from the political structure of the failing villages, the, the, the political structure. So the, I, the ideas that he has brought as a practice is to be autonomous of that old structure and create something new that is many villages coming together. Um, so it's not autonomous as in separation. Um, and in fact, if anything, the rural work is a link between urban and rural and a link between rural and rural. So. Uh, the idea of autonomy is also something that we do not discuss, I think, enough in North America. The question of scale is one that um, we don't talk about in North America at all. We simply say you must scale up. Um, and the conversations that I think we will have this evening will begin to address questions about the right size community. Is there a right size community? Or are we even having conversations about that right size? Is it large enough to give plurality, but small enough to give access to power? Is it so small that there's the dictatorship of small places and not large enough to bring in new ideas and new, new um, breaths of fresh air? Um, this question of right size communities are ones that I think small rural places feel very isolated from because everything has to be bigger and better. Um, I think the ideas that um, uh, Siyoshi brings address this question of right size, and, and I, I suspect that Janet has also encountered this. And at the end of the day, it is management. How do you actually manage resources, people, human capital, social capital, financial capital, and who is to do that and in what manner? And the regional management organization that um, um, Siyoshi founded is the key to something that was lacking in the rural areas and that he has built and has ideas on, on how it functions. Um, and I think, you know, unlike maybe or maybe like the rural hubs that um, Janet Topolsky with the Aspen Institute has been spending so much time with, is the regional, ma regional manage management organization is holistic. So it, 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 it straddles so many different disciplines and that I find particularly exciting. And then there is the rice covenant. So a region that is known for growing rice, um, very clean rice, 
um, one that needs to sell its rights to the outside world, um, for whom there is hope that people will come to the rural area. So it's not just shipping the rice elsewhere, but people coming in to purchase the rice, to help grow the rice, to be part of the whole culture of the place, to be a repeat visitor. What is so exciting is that consumers purchase the rice with a covenant. They become party to the rice covenant, which means they become, in this rice covenant, they become members of the community. It's like an insurance policy. If you live in the giant city under stress, fearful of the next natural disaster to come, the Rice Covenant says you have a safe refuge here. You have a home here, a place to go to. As someone who has experienced natural disasters in, in Louisiana with, with hurricanes, um, even before Hurricane Katrina, the farmers I used to work with, we used to talk about, so which farm would we go to when we need it, you know, when the zombie invasion comes? Um, so this idea of the Rice Covenant is taking the CSA the community-supported agricultural model, and to a whole other depth of social contract and obligation that is wider than the geographic place of the rural community. And then when you came in, um, you um, probably picked up, do you have a, a, a copy of the manifesto, the Cooney Manifesto? What excited me about the manifesto and the idea of Cooney, the ancient term for the nation, is that Tsuyoshi has readapted it to a different scale of place, the small community and the links between the communities. And as someone who I studied political science and political theory and obsessed with nationalism and the ideas of the nation, um, I can't help but think of Benedict Anderson's work on um, nationalism, in particular looking at Indonesian uh, nationalism in his book, imagined communities. And the idea that the nation is so large that you could never know everyone, but it's an idea, an idea that you have a connection. And what is so extraordinary in this day and age of deconstruction and large and small organizations trying to f figure out who are we affiliated with, who are we connected to, that um, Sayoshi's Kuni Manifesto is reimagining the sense of community, and I, I think that is um, something that we need to hear more of. So I wanted to just clarify some of the terms, the concepts that really excited me in his, uh, in his, his actions and his thinking, and i um, so excited for him to follow me up here. So, Siyoshi Sakihara. Good evening, everyone. えっと、so Richard has explained everything, so I think I'll just add something to it. えっと、今これからお話しするのはとっても小さな出来事です。there is a Buddhist expression that says one has everything and everything has one. So, please keep that in your mind onwards. あ、その前に私あの、I have 66 slides and I think I've just given 15 minutes, total of 30 minutes because there is consecutive translation. mission impossible みたいな Yes. Uh, mission impossible. Here we go. えっと、まあ、私がこの let me just give you a little of the background of the time, around the time that I started organization. And there was this acceleration of annexation that happened of all these municipal municipalities in Japan. So what you see, this slide shows that in the center there is a city and then it's surrounded by all these small communities, villages and towns. 
And then due to annexation, it creates this big one city. とみんな思ったんですが、現実にはこうではなくて、こんな感じです。大きくなったはずのものは、霧のように薄い広がりになってしまった。It became something big, but it looked like a mist, something rather vague. で、えー、実際にはこういう薄さの中で、住民の,その自治に関わろうという気持ちがなくなってしまいました。So really sort of uh, もちろん、合併した村や町もどんどん薄くなって、まあ、人もいなくなって、まさに本当に。大きな一つではなくて、消滅寸前の薄い霧のような状態になったということです。So what happened is it just didn't become a solid big city, but sort of a mist on the verge of extinction where people are not so interested in being part of a community. で、ここで私たちがいろいろ活動したときに、ある人口の範囲だと活動がとてもこう活発になるという、そのある人口の規模に気がつきました。私たちはすぐ大きなもの全部で活動的になろうと考えるんですがそうではなくて大きなものの中の小さなものがとても活動的になることで全体も活動的になるという形を。まあ、考え直すべきだろうと思いますそう、so、we may tend to think that then you have this one big thing and then it can really activate something. But what I saw is that if you have this これは分析とか何かではなくて、もうまさに経験によって肌で感じた人口規模です。So this is not something that's based on some sort of analysis, but this is based on my own experience, what I felt. 息苦しくなく、知らじらしくない。So it's not suffocating, it's not brazen. ですごくあの単純な事実に気がつきました、この活動をしていて。And、uh, I realized something quite simple. 私たちはという主語を語るにはある適正な人口規模がいるんだということですね。So right、では、小さかったり、小さすぎたり、大きすぎたらどういうことがなるかというとです、ね、まず日本の場合なんですけど、この100ぐらいの場合、100以下の場合、見てください。まあ、こんなようなちょっと辛いことが起こります。この中で一番辛い出来事は小さな独裁が発生するということです。で、1万を超えてしまっただけなのに、今度またもうこういういろいろ困難なことが起こってしまいます。特に辛いのはこの自治体が無効成果することや対話するっていうことがなくなって、まあネットで通信するだけになっていくっていう中ですね。And if their population size is more than 10,000, I think some of the difficult things that would happen is that the local government would lost its individuality as well as there's going to be the shortage of dialogue. People stop talking to each other. コミュニティを考える上で人口の魔法があるっていうことに少し気がつきました。どうも、あごめんなさい、このぐらいでも、こういうこと言うと、えー、825人はだめなのかとか言う人がいますけど、そういう話ではないですね。まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、まあ、あるいは1500ぐらいの人口があって、そして現実に存在する土地の広がりがあって、で具体的な出来事がある。これがまず要件3つ必要です。So you have to fill for these three conditions that you have the right size population, which should be 800 or 1500, and you have this land, which is the right size, not too big, not too small, and then you have events. 
、でこれを持ってるとこはみんな持ってて当たり前なんですけども最後のこの4番目の要素 RMO っていう組織を持っていないがために活動的なものにすなわち国にはなれないでいるということですね。And I think the first three actually no brainers. I mean, I think you can find this anywhere. But what you actually need the fourth element, it's the regional management organization RMO. And then by having that, you can actually form a CUNY. で、ね、この RMO の要点を言えば、大事なことを言えば、まずあのつなぎの能力とかマネジメント能力、相互事務能力があること。So, when you look at this slide, I mean, there you can see everything on the list, but what I'd like to point out is particularly RMO should be able to be a good connector, a nexus of everything, also has the ability to, be a ma to manage things, as well as a very good at competent with administrative work. Incorporated entity. And of course, have a full time staff who is dedicated to the work of RMO. こう言えばとても簡単なことに聞こえますが、これが日本の農産村の地域再生では大変難しくなっています。今、10分のサインが来ましたので、あと20分ですね。Okay, 20 to go. さあ、じゃあ具体的な事例を話しましょうか。So let me give you some concrete examples. これがその上越後山里ファンクラブというもののまあ具体的事例なんですけど2002年に法人化されました、so、in 2002会員数は300And the memberships, 300 memberships. 実際の構成人員は600人ぐらい But that's actually a total number of members is 600. で面白いことにあの地域が30近い都市が30東京みたいなのが三十って面白い人口構成になってます。At, uh, breakdown, area, area, cities, で、スタッフが八人ぐらい。Full time staff eight。で、パートタイムの方が地域の方で三十人ぐらい。And part time staff there will be thirty from the local area。で、年間予算があの五千万円でこれかなり大きい方です。And we're talking about the annual budget, it's about、uh, 50 million yen.、うん uh, it's, that's not a small penny in Japan. So, the number of 25 communities, hamlets in the area, total population of 1800. でここでえー、その RMO として機能するために、このひどく単純な12の項目こそが必要なのだということに気がつきました。皆さん、こんな簡単なことがと思われると思うんです。So you at this list and you think, oh, sounds so、easy. でも、これを一つの組織がすべてやるということはかなり難しいんです。But for one organization to manage everything that's on this list is difficult. そして合併してしまった自治体はもう,こう小さな村をに関与するような力がないので公共的なことはどんどん中止されていきます。Happens, actually, old, tasks, uh, この中でとても重要なのを2つ挙げれば地域の資源で産業を作ること。So, there are two things I'd like to actually mention that's really important is to create local industry, local economy using local resource.、うん、And yes, number three, which is to extend the healthy living years of the elderly. And the other thing that's important is that it's not run by two separate organizations, but this one organization undertakes both tasks. このような RMO の仕事の比率を見ますと、大体公共的なものが3割、で地域資源での産業が7割という感じになります。Of out, sort of sort of この 30% こそがとても重要なのですけど、しかしながらこれは今、制度がないので。無償労働っていうことになってます。So this is the unpaid voluntary work when you look at the 30% because there is it's not systematic. 
それがあの働く若者の就労条件を不安定にしているではお前言ってることは本当かと思われると思うんで急ぎ足で12項目の現実を見てみましょうこれは1大体こう地域の保全ってこんな感じですね。So this is working in the local area, uh, weeding. これが面白いのが、冬、雪に閉ざされた農村でお使いに行く。So wintertime, um, actually go out shopping on behalf of the elderly because there's so much snow in the area. 彼女はお使いにしてるんですけど、まあ、大体こう水路に落ちるわけですね。Yeah, sometimes she just kind of falls in the waterway on the way, so much snow. で、おばあさんのところにミルクココアとかお肉が行く。And then she, I think she actually has, um, こん,こ,んなこんな小さなことなんですけど、これとても重要です。Small, really うん、それからこう失われつつある文化を保護する。Maintain, uh, folklore, こんなのや、like、こんなのや、これは盆踊り、This is the bond dance. これは結婚式、Wedding. これ我々が入ったとき、これらのことはもう40年前にやめたんだと言われました。それを知っている人がいる間に私たちは聞き出して、記録し、復元しました。そして、それを知っている人がいる間に、作ることができなかったのを RMO が助けていくということです。こういう補助もする。こういう技能も受け継いでいくということです。彼は最後の水車職人で、えっと、これを教わった次の年に亡くなってしまいました。The gentleman who is there is actually the last, he was the last living craftsman who can make water wheels, but the, the year after the spot photo was taken, he passed away. あるいはこういう文化的な行事をやる。And we also organize cultural events. それからいろんな民具の寄付を受けるので、こういうミュージアムを自分たちで作るという。And we also created this small museum because we get all these donations of these traditional utensils. まあ、こんなような桶の展示会、うん。それから、高齢者が持っている写真を全部、電子データにしてライブラリを作るっていうまあ地味な仕事ですけど。一人暮らしの老人たちは、その方が死ぬと、写真がもうどこにあるのか、誰もわからないので、ゴミにされてしまいます。私たちはこの画面から学び取れることが非常に多いです。それから地域の高齢者の健康年齢を伸ばすためのを伸ばすためのサロンをなんと年間180日開催しています。And then we also この小さな公共交通はまだできてないです。それから地域の小中学生にその地域に戻ってきてもらえるような地域教育をしています。We also provide this、uh, educational opportunities to elementary school and junior high school students about the region, so with the hope that they will come back. まあ、こういうことですね。まあ、見てもらえば分かるんですけど、こういうような林業の講習。で、この田んぼは1000年続いてるんですけど、こういうものをまあ守っていくという。で、この地域資源の産業が大事なんですけど、とても大事なのはここで、優等生の村が勝ち残るんじゃなくて、普通の村が生き残れる構造。生の村が勝ち残るんじゃなくて、普通の村が生き残れる構造。So, local industry is very important. As you can see, the second part of the slide, we want to create a system that the average village is to, to become sustainable, where it's not for the top villages to be sustainable. I just want to, you know, to, for you to take a glance at this slide because Richard explained the rice covenant so well. 
So you can take a quick glance. だけどこれは本当に重要な出来事になります。But this is really、important. で、今度は産の、えー、と産業ちっちゃな産業についてみましょう。So、we're going to take a look at small industries. 味噌作ってます。Making m i s o 一トンですね。This is one ton. 梅干し作ってます。地域で。Plums, 梅干し。自分たちでパッケージデザインをして自分たちで売ると。Designs up, we design the package and we sell them.、うん、こういうカフェのようなものを方々に作ってきます。So we also have some cafes in the area. こういうふうに地域で使われない材木で何か産業を起こそうというこういう開発もしていきます。And also we use the local wood in the area and then create do product development. で、こういう立っても200年近い古民家がたくさんあるのでこれをどうするんだというのが問題になってきます。So there are all these old farmhouses that have been around for more than 200 years and they're abandoned. So we've tried to figure out a way what to do with them. これをお金持ちが別荘で使うのではなくて、地域コミュニティが利用するという形に変えていきます。So what it is, it's not going to be sold at the country house for the rich, but something that the community can use. 中を改装し、きれいにしていって、地域の食材でを提供するのはカフェにして、みんな地域の食材を使っていくという。We renovated inside and we provide food with local produce using local And there is also spring water. それからこういうゲストハウスみたいなのもあの使われなくなった施設を作って、まあ、何でもやっていくということです、ね。それから市役所からこういう森林公園なんかの受託ももちろん受けてます。ああ、それからこれだ大事なんですけど、こういう人たちが都市から通ってくる人たちです。So these are the people who actually come from the urban areas. Okansha, to be m a s So in Japanese, it's Okansha,、うん、and in English, we say repeat visitors. I'll explain it to you later about this more. And this is talking about the filter function. Okay, 20分経過しました。Okay, or 20 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. えっと、これは何かというと。無作為に何でも村に入ってくるのではなくて、いいものは入れるけど、悪いものは入れないという役目をこの国の組織が担うということです。So what it is is we just the village should be taking everything so that we will make sure that we'll filter out something that's not desirable to the village, but we'll take in what is good. でこんな小さな出来事なんですけど、そこで働くスタッフのスキルっていうのは非常に大変なものがあります。So, in a small space like this, the skills that's required for the staff who's going to work there is reflected on this slide. So, the skills that are required やってはいます。さて一つびっくりする例ですけど、その高齢者の健康年齢を伸ばすということで、私たちの村にたった六十人の高齢者がいる村があります。So one thing that which we we were surprised to find out is that so there is a village with a elderly population of sixty。平均でその方たちは都市部よりも五年間保険の開始年齢が遅い。So, on average,、um, the, the time that they, they, they need to subscribe to the elderly care insurance was five years later than、uh, someone of the same age in the urban area. So, you keep them healthy five years average than the urbanites. で本来、えー、と役所がかかるはずのお金を実は7億円も節約しているということが判明しました。So we found out that we are we actually saving so much money for the local government of 700 million yen. RMO ができてたった一つの村だけでこのお金が節約できています。So thanks to the RMO in this just one village they could save this much money. 
私はなんで保険会社の方々がこれに着目してくれないのか不思議です。So、I just wonder, how come the insurance company is not interested in this? このおかげで保険会社が一番儲かるはず。Because I think the insurance company can make so much money off this. この中にそういう方がいたら寄付をお願いします。So yes, if any of you work for the insurance companies, please make a donation. <笑><笑>で、いや、莫大な金額ですよ。It's a lot of money we're talking about. さて、ここ、これがとても重要です。So、this is a very important point I'd like to make. うん、やはりあの地域はいろんな今こういう問題を抱えているので、えー、こういう人たちが都市から応援する人がとても重要になる。So pro- really うん、あこれですね。これあごめんなさい。もうやばいですけど、ね、時間が。この辺。でも大事なところなんでちょっと目で見てください。So、mind, slide, 深刻な問題です。Th- それからこれ。今いろいろ地域再生をしてるんですけど、こういうことの合意がないままバラバラにやってるんです。So there is regional revitalization that is happening. However, there is no consensus when it comes to the Issues that I address on this slide. ね、で、ちょっとおさらいになりますけど、so、back, 小さすぎることの弊害、これもちょっと目で読んでください。Sort of stated, うん、so small, 特にやっぱりこの小さな独裁が発生すること。これは東京みたいに大きいところが抱える問題です。I listed the issue, the issues.、Um, まあ他者の背景か。For example,、um, others are sort of would blend in as part of the background. So you don't recognize them others. 人間の部品か。So、uh, human s i n g as just a, a cogwheel. 貧富の階層がバラバラになって、階層ができてしまって、えー、その中から金持ちに対してこうルサンチマンを持つ人々が出てくる。And the stratification of class systems. So what happens is there is a sense of resentment towards the rich among the poor. I call the people、um, who actually sort of go on in sort of individual terrorism the new savage, the beast. And what I call the people who actually sort of go on in sort of individual terrorism the new savage, I think the problem we see right now is that either we have to choose the small dictatorship or the new beast. ここがない。ちょうどいい場所がない。That's what's missing. さあ、これはまあ、模式図だからいいんですけども、so、sort of これもいいです。まあ、フラクタルなというか、こういう、都市が上ではなく、並列な関係性ができるだろう。So it's 国一個ずつは小さいですけど、それらのネットワークは多分大きな力になる。The Kuni itself might be very small, but the network can engender bigger power. で、20年近くやってきて、このような活動する人は大変多くはなく、<笑>本当にこの現代のシーシポスが必要になるということが分かってきました。So I've been in this field for more than 20 years, and then what I feel right now is that there is the need For the Sisyphus of our time. これはギリシャ神話に出てくるやつですけども、まあ、時間がないのであれですけども、アルベル・カミの書いたシューシュポスの方だと思ってください。要するに私たちが、私がこれから求めるのはこういう若者です。So what I'm looking for into Young people right now is what you see on this slide. 特にこの、まあ、見ていただければ、この与えられた価値観ではなくの価値負けではなくというところを着目していただきたい。Pay attention, it's not about winning and losing. あと、その自己区議的な生き方でそれでいいという人間。And someone who is fine to be self-sacrificial. さて、えー、もう時間がやばいと思うんで、これ最後。まあ小さなことをお話ししましたけど、その小さなことがもしきちんとできたら、国という考えはもう一個新しい
文化勢力になるだろうというふうに思っています。I must have just spoke about something rather small, minute perhaps. But、うん、actually, k u n i can become a very big idea if it's executed properly. 例えば多文化主義の失敗とかさまざまなところがあったんですけどもそういうことを全部国家がやるのではなくコミュニティレベルで自分たちの受け入れ方を決めていくということはすごく重要だと思います。I think what is really important is, for example, we've seen the failure of multilateralism and stuff. However, if the community itself can decide how to really engage and be open, I think that could really lead to a better. ですから国は各国が行き詰まってしまったもしかしたら移民問題の中で多少の解決の糸口を含んでいるかもしれません。So, maybe more or less, I'm not sure, but Kuni could also be a solution in terms of places have encountered issues of immigration, but maybe there is some sort of solution that there is a clue for that in Kuni. これはこの9月に私があの海で拾ったカモメの羽です。This is a feather that I, it's a seagull. Feather I picked up on the beach back in September. こういう意味合いで国のマークにしてみました。So、sort of さあ、私の説明はこれで終わりです。This is it. どうもありがとうございます。Thank you so much. <笑>
And, you know, it's worth knowing also that half of the rural counties grew during that period of time. And, you know, we have a lot of rural counties. Two-thirds of the counties in the United States are rural. The other thing that's worth knowing is that every state in the union has some rural counties that are growing and some that are declining, right? And so this is not the media picture we get of rural, especially since, you know, uh, recent political events. Uh, there's a lot of trashing of rural. Um, other analysis shows is they're now brain gain. There are people in the ages from 39 to 49, 30 to 49 and 50 to 64 age groups that are moving into rural. And why is that? It's because people are looking for a better quality of life. It's because they are looking for safety, slower pace, security, lower housing costs. So there, there are a lot of reasons. Now, the rural places they are growing, they tend to be near metropolitan areas. They tend to be uh, uh, ones that have abundant beauty and natural resources. They attract retirees. Uh, communities that are employing immigrants are growing. And uh, th ones that have special institutions like college towns. So the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is what the economic base is of rural in the United States. So I, I ask anybody, shout out, what do you think? So I think of the economic base in terms of people which is the labor force, right? What industries are employing the most rural people? Any, anyone want to shout one out? What industries employ the most rural people in the United States? Food? Processing. Food processing. Any other guesses? Energy. Energy. Any other guesses? Agriculture. Agriculture. So any, anything else? Education, that's a good one, because health and education is actually the largest employer of rural people, of rural workers. 25% of the rural workforce is health and education, which is largely government. So good, good for you. Red, um, you know, what, what color star do we want to give you? Give you a star. The second largest sector employing rural people is manufacturing at 22%. And in fact, the percentage of the Rural work, uh, the percentage of workforce in rural, I'm sorry, it's always hard to say this for me. Uh, manufacturing employs a larger percentage of the rural workforce than it does of the urban workforce. And that's not something we would normally think. Trade, transport, utilities, 20%. Leisure, recreation, tourism, hospitality, 11%. Agriculture, 5% of the rural workforce. So I, I'm not saying that agriculture is not an important economic driver. It's just a matter of when we think of the people in rural and, you know, and what they're doing on a daily basis, it looks a lot more like urban America than, than you think. Right? So that, that's a, a couple things. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is poverty. Because the rural poverty rate is actually um, greater in rural America than it is in urban America, which is another thing a lot of people don't understand. 16.4% compared to 12.9% in urban, and for children it's even higher. It's worse for every people of color designation in rural rather than ur urban, rather except for Asian, I would say. And you know, you have a lot of health and hospital closures because of the lack of Medicaid expansion. Opioid, suicide, diabetes are all worse in rural. Now, the other thing that is often not understood is the diversity of rural America. People of color comprise 21% of the rural population. Um, but they produced 83% of its recent growth between 2000 and 2010. It's people of color. 54% of the Native American population is rural. And it's important to understand that patterns vary across geographies, but Job-seeking immigrants are a driving force behind recent population upturns. From 2010 to 2016, immigrants were responsible for 37% of the overall rural population growth. And, and this is all to say, I mean, you know, there's a lot of focus in the country now and around the world around inequality and equity. And it's just important to understand that you cannot work in equity and equality in the United States without working in rural America. All right. And that's something that is not necessarily understood. Now, there are enormous connections between urban and rural areas that I think Seki Harasan talked about, Richard talks about, but we need to think about them. Water and air quality. Uh, rural people are stewards of what urban people need as well as rural people need. Energy, wind, water, biofuel, mining, oil. 
you know, the r urban and rural America are both dependent on interdependent because of that. Land, because of land, agriculture, ecosystem services, recreation, tourism. 97% of the land is rural in this country and two thirds of the counties. But we also don't think about the fact that we depend on rural for people, right? People who are innovative, people who are productive, who may not stay in rural, but they grow up there and they're educated there. And then they move somewhere else sometimes. But a lot of urban people move too. The J-turn happens with urban as well as rural people. Um, and the military, 54% of our recruits, 24% of our veterans are rural. So there are some trends that have recently hit rural America pretty hard, as well as urban America. And I would say the first one is technology. It's really changed the nature of jobs, and it's changed the education that people need in order to work. But in rural, there's an essential factor, which is connectivity and broadband. And that we've had trouble moving rural ahead, as well as many urban neighborhoods, because of the lack of broadband connectivity. Uh, it's also had major changes in communication. Because of the way people get information now, newspapers and journalism have fallen away even more in rural than in urban. And we, when we wonder why, I mean, when people are all getting their news from the same channels in rural America, it, it explains a lot, right? So the industry mix is different now. Uh, I talked about that earlier. There's also the rise of renewable energy, wonderful trends in tourism, outdoor recreation, environmental agritourism, agri historic and cultural tourism. The movement towards localism really brings rural together. And there's a lot of offshoring, but there's now there's a lot of onshoring of things like manufacturing that are going to rural. Climate change has a huge impact on rural. There are many natural disasters, floods, fires, tornadoes, coastal fisheries, tourism, they're all affected. So the economic base is affected. And there are changes in what you can grow in agriculture, where and when you can grow it. And finally, government, and this is where I'm going to transition to talking uh, about rural development hubs and, and relate to what Seki Harasan talked about, is government across the country, there's been a large rise in unfunded mandates and a decline in state and federal funding across the country uh, for doing community and economic development and helping people get ahead. There's political deadlock, which I don't have to talk to anyone here about, and also because of political deadlock, I think there's been a lack of creativity sort of in how do we address these things through government. I, I really, I, I was at a global uh, inclusive economy summit yesterday and Madeleine Albright, our former Secretary of State was there and she had a great quote which she, she said wasn't hers but she didn't attribute it to somebody so I don't know whose it was. But she said, people in our country today are talking to government using 21st century technology Government is listening on 20th century technology, and they are providing 19th century solutions. And that's pretty much right. I don't, it, does anyone here know who said that? Because she was quoting someone, but she didn't say. So we've got this situation, and you know, when there's limited base in rural America for any tax revenue, and that's really where I'm going to connect here with what Saki, Saki Harrison spoke about. Now, I'm from Michigan. I grew up, born and raised in the city of Detroit. And, and you know, uh, if you're from Michigan, you always hold up, you know, here's the lower peninsula, and I always say the upper peninsula. But, you know, there are some people in Michigan, you ask, where are you from? And they say, we're from the thumb, right? We're from the thumb. Now, the thumb is this part of Michigan here, over here. And, uh, you know, you say, well, where are you from in the thumb? And they say, I'm from the thumb. Now, the thumb has, multi it's rural. The thumb is rural. And there are many communities in the thumb. And they say they're from the, some, from the thumb. They don't say they're from a community. Because all those communities share something. They have similar challenges. They have a similar economy. They have similar culture. You know. And when they want to act on something, though, there's no government of the thumb. right? So people identify with the place and the culture and the economy that is that place, maybe the media market that is that place, and they have common cause, but they have no one to act on their behalf, right? So there's this issue of no government of these regions that are largely rural or might be uh, urban and rural together and have common experience. So what we've noticed in recent years is that there's this vacuum is sort of being filled. 
And that vacuum is sort of being filled with what our program is, is giving the name Rural Development Hubs. And what we've noticed in our years of work across rural America, there are these organizations, and they might have started as a community foundation. They might have started as the Chamber of Commerce. They might have started as a community action agency, which is an anti-poverty agency created during the war on poverty. They might have started as a community college. They might have started as something else. But they morph into doing what a region needs to do. Because there are people like the people that Seki Harrison talked about that aren't about winning and losing, and they're not about, uh, they, they're willing to I, sacrifice themselves, might be <laughs> one way of looking at it, to sort of say, we have some common issues here, and there, there's a problem, and there's no one with the job here to act on it. So as as organizations, we're going to morph beyond what we were. Maybe we were doing business lending. Now we're going to do a business business assistance. Maybe we're going to start doing lending to individuals instead of just a business. Maybe we're going to start uh, creating new pro products. Maybe we're going to start doing something different. And and these organizations are emerging in rural America. And what's interesting is there's there's you know there's no one helping them do it. And there's no one who trains them to do it. It's just happening. And so what, what I would say about these rural development hubs is what they try to do is focus on the system. They look at what's going on in this region, right? And, and, and you know, where are the gaps? And how can we form partnerships or develop new ways of working in order to fill the gaps? So they focus on all the critical ingredients they focus on the people side of development. They focus on the business side of development. They focus on the community building side of development. They focus on community engagement. Um, and they work to strengthen critical components and, and, and fill gaps. Now, this is sort of important because we have a lot of siloing of organizations in this country. We, we, we tend to form organizations, whether they're governmental, non-governmental, for-profit, non-profit, that you know, focus on place issues, they focus on social people issues, or they focus on economy issues, all right? And the, the issue at the regional level or at the community level is that those things have to be worked on together, which I think is, is the same thing Seki Harasan said about the, the 12 different functions. You have to work on all of those things in order to improve community and improve prosperity for people, especially people who aren't doing well. But we tend to focus on one piece of a problem when really it's a complex thing. And what these rural development hubs are doing is trying to look at the whole system and say, OK, so we're business assistants, but we've got this issue with workforce development, so we're going to go in and start doing that too. right? So you know, no one asks them to do it. They just do it. But they're emerging, and, and we need more of them than they need to be stronger. I gave you a little, little summary of a report we're about to publish, actually, in the next two weeks. But as I said, they can be any kind of organization, community loan funds, CDFIs, credit unions, community foundations, family foundations, health legacy foundations, community development organizations, United Ways, social enterprises, unicorn organizations that aren't anything. So let me give you a couple quick, how am I doing on time? I'm over? Well, I'm going to give two examples and then, then a couple comparisons, and then I'm going to move on, OK? Then we'll be done. Um, in Wisconsin, central Wisconsin, OK, Wisconsin Rapids. So this was a many, uh, 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 paper and, and timber um, town. And a very beneficent, um, uh, the paper industry went downhill. The, a very beneficent owner of the paper company sold it off, it then got sold off again, it then got sold off again, and then got closed. 3,000 people in sort of a region of 30,000 out of jobs, it was, it was really bad. Or actually it was 30% of the jobs were lost. What the local community foundation did is say, okay, we had a dependency on that company and no one knows what to do. So this local community foundation joined with the Chamber of Commerce and they, they convened everyone, said, what do we want our community to be? Because no one knew what to do. It, they'd been a beneficent tyrant, the company. Um, and, and they were helpless. They'd been dependent without knowing it. And this community foundation and Chamber of Congress really retrained people in how to be adaptive leaders. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. Then the community foundation bought the abandoned newspaper building 
on the waterfront. And in a paper, in a paper town, you don't want to go anywhere near the water because the water smells because of uh, the, the um, what, what's the word I want, the refuse? Not the refuse, yeah, of the paper mill. And so now they have a beautiful waterfront, but everything's abandoned on it. So the Green Foundation buys this building, engages 2,000 people in the region to come in and say, what do we want to do with this building, right? So it gives everyone a sense of agency to sort of say, we're going to recreate this. And I mean, and then the, the Community Foundation said, let's stop publishing an annual report. Instead, let's have a community picnic. And the first year they did it, they got some farmers to give them some corn, and they had a couple hundred people show up. And now in its eighth year, 8,000 people show up on that lakefront, even though building, the building is not yet developed, to say, we are part of this community, and all the food is donated. So I'm just sort of trying to give you an example of this. This foundation saw the gaps, saw what wasn't happening in the community, and began to put together the partnerships and ask people to be part of the solution. I have a story for every state. You know, I can give you many stories, and I don't want to run more over. But I just want to say quickly what I think of the commonalities with what between regional develop, or rural development hubs here and what Seki Harasan was talking about. These organizations do an analysis of the local situation, right? They think about what's really going on, the truth of what's going on. They don't just look at their sliver of it. They move from being transactional to transformational. They do economic development differently. They, they say, what are the assets we have we can build on? They're not looking for outside, salvation from outside. You know, the Black Belt Community Foundation in, in, in Alabama has a great slogan. They say, we're going to take what we have to make what we need. And it's very simple, but it's extremely profound. And that's the approach that regional development, rural development hub take. They care about relationships. They build relationships of trust with people in the community, relationships of trust with partners, and relationships with markets as well which is a really, really important relationship. They, they're not trying to develop goods or services or products that somebody doesn't want. They really consult the market, whether it's urban or rural, and build trusting relationships so that they can provide what is needed and build new economies. They need administrative and management capabilities and staff, just as Seki Harasan said, but there's no training program for them. There's, there's no rural development hub program in any university. There's urban studies and there's regional studies, but there isn't study for this. And it requires a wide range of abilities, as Seki Harasan said. Uh, they have highly effective boards willing to take risks and they serve as intermediaries. The differences, I would say, are between what Seki Harasan talked about and, and what I see going on here is I don't think there's a right size necessarily. I think the size is determined by the action you're trying to take. And I have a sense that there are action sheds, different action sheds for different activities that you take on. Because I've seen these hubs work in communities of 230 and I've seen them work in across four states. Um, the functions that are on the table, the 12 functions that Sekhi Harrison, they may not all be addressed by all rural development hubs. It just depends on what the situation is there. They're not any one kind of organization, as I said. And I think it's less intentional than it is sort of evolutionary and driven by crisis and opportunity. And they're not self-sustaining, right? Um, most constantly find, raise, and braid funds to do what needs to be done. But these rural development hubs in this country are important we need more of them. We need them to be stronger. They are filling a gap that no one else is doing. Government's not doing it. No one's taking it on. Um, and we really have to do this to improve the health of our nation and the well-being of all of our people. We need to strengthen rural development hubs and build connections between them and urban America. That's it. Stories when they work best. Um, help us rethink the stories we're telling ourselves about ourselves and about place. So I wanted to just do an experiment. Um, I looked up the definition of rural earlier today, and of course it can be defined. I know. See, well, this is why I'm going to ask this question. So it can be defined in any, through any metric, economic, people, system. Um, but I wanted to, to tell you what Merriam-Webster defines it as, and that's the one we use in the newsroom, the dictionary we use in the newsroom. And I, it occurs to me 
that this gives us a lot of room to reframe the language that we're using. That's, that's sort of my medium. So Merriam-Webster defines it this way, of or relating to the country, country people or life, or agriculture. And I wonder if there's a room for a new definition and how each one of you would define it. What is a better way to talk about rural? Sekihara san. Yes, please. We're going to be polite and let him go first. あ、えっと、ちょ、いいですか。え、ルーラルの定義っていうか私が考える新しい定義はまずルーラルは何かっていうと自給性という言葉が大変重要になると思います。So my definition of rural would be um self-sufficiency. 現実のルーラルは本当にそこにある産物で何とか生き残ることができる場所です。so the rural reality is a place that uh, you'll be able to survive uh, with what you have in front of yourself. それから2つ目が、経の把握ができるということで、え、そこから雨が降ったらこの川になってこういうふうに水を使ったらここの海で蒸発してまた雨が降りますというようなサイクルを把握できる場です。it is uh, also a place that you'll be able to understand the circularity that where the water flows and where it ends up and then it ends up in the ocean and then it evaporates and it comes back again as rain. So if you're able to understand that circularity. Let's say you uh, buy a package of meat in an urban area. You have no idea where that piece of meat came from. So that cycle is hidden and you just see that meat in front of you. And that is the characteristics of urban. So ではないかなというふうにまあちょっと希望を込めて思います。I say it with hope, but rural is a place that you'll be able to understand that context and circularity. That's how I like to define it. That's far better than country life. Country life. Slightly more nuanced. Ah, I, I, we don't define it. We don't define it because it's it's. There are, you know, fe the federal government itself has about, I don't know, several hundred definitions of rural in different programs. And it's, it's become one of those, like, sort of s discussions that has to happen all the time. And it doesn't get you anywhere. The point is, there are people living in the United States that are not in major cities. Um, and there are things that they are doing. And those things are part of our nation and they're important to our nation. And... Uh, in the same way that urban people, places, and activities are important to our nation. And so the, the, what's the utility of defining it? I mean, I understand that, you know, I, I don't agree with Merriam-Webster's definition, I'll say that much. <laughs> I mean, agriculture, really? After what I just said? Um, it, it, whenever you talk to someone who does a lot of work in rural America, and that question is asked, you will get the same eye roll you got from me. What's the utility of it? So I'm going to start gonna a conference the question. to have a conference in an urban place about the future of rural America. I guarantee you we'll, we'll all get an invite to one of those tomorrow. All right. All Richard, right. what is your take on that? Well, I am mm. when Janet, you and I were working many years ago looking at rural development and community philanthropy. And we had a meeting in a rural place. And then as we were driving there, we were trying to define, well, what is the definition of rural? Is there a traffic light? Does that make it urban or rural? Do we see farm animals? Does that make it urban or rural? And, and we laugh that this is a troubling conversation. Um, but what I think what I've seen wherever I've traveled around the world is um, 
the lines between urban and rural are incredibly diffused and complicated and maybe becoming even more so. Um, and what, more than defining it, what we are interested in is trying to defend places and people that take care of those places. And what is so attractive and maybe, you know, the, the mythology of, of rural is that there is a connection to natural capital because it is there and difficult to, you can see it, you can experience it. The problem is we tend to extract it. And what excites me in conversations about rural is there seems to be a revived excitement to regenerate those resources. And I think we in urban areas can learn from that and can try and bring some element of that to soften the edges of our urban scape, whether it is markets or gardens and greenery and, and, and maintaining water systems in urban areas. We have so much to learn from the practicalities of rural. And, you know, I, I, in terms of official definitions, it has changed, too, over time. There was a time that, uh, you know, uh, urban was 2,000 people, right? So as the definition, really, the definition is defined as non-urban in many ways. And so as the definition of urban has changed in this country, the definition of rural has changed. So it's, there's no absolute. It's a matter of you know it when you're there. You know it when you see it. And I mean, you know, people have different images of this too. I mean, I know, I've talked to people who think Madison, Wisconsin is rural, you know, and others that don't. So once again, what's the utility? So then I want to talk about us a little bit. And so, um, Sekihara-san, when we were upstairs, you talked a lot about, or in what little time we had, we got into, and I want to just dig in a, a slightly more, into outsiders and how a rural community thinks about outsiders. And we got such a brief look at it um, during your slides. But thinking about nurturing relationships with repeat visitors, how should we be thinking about ourselves as people who are going to walk out and get a lift or a cab and sit in some traffic and have an urban experience tonight? How do we engage? How do we begin to engage? So how to engage people living in a city, urban areas? I may say something that's quite off the target, off the mark. When you think of a community, what you have to find out is who you are and who the others are. And so what I end up doing is that I always question myself, who am I? And I am able to come up with the answer and I feel perplexed. But by questioning who you are, you will start discovering what you need. So what I would say is, so in other words, I think that is also a search, what kind of life you want to live. So when you start asking the question about yourself and when you search for the answer, Perhaps maybe you'll see you will get to rural. ですから皆さんに田舎のためにお願いしたいのはまず皆さんが私は誰だと考えていただき私はどのように行きたいかと考えていただいたときにそれともしかしたら田舎が持っている何かを結びつけて考えていただくということだと思います。So by asking who you are and searching for the answer, perhaps what rural beholds, something in there, you can find the extension of 
the answer that you're looking for? 以上です。<笑>ちょっと言い方が暗くてすみません。I'm sorry, I'm, I, do I sound depressed? 基本,、はい、<笑>基本的にあの悲観主義者なんです。I'm a bit of a pessimist. でも毎日悲観主義でいると最後は楽天主義になりますよ。But every day if you're a pessimist, at the end of the day you become an optimist. <笑><笑><笑>ですから。To be a place polygamist, that we can live in one place and care about other places. We can have a relationship with the other places.、Mm-hmm. Um, that we are, we are not just wedded to that place, we're ledded, wedded to, I think, what, what Janet described, beyond the transactions, but to the transformational relationships. And in this age where we do travel,、um, this is an opportunity for small. Rural places to begin to recognize and trade their assets and trade in a way with urban dwellers, the visitors, the repeat visitors, not so much to say we have wonderful things, come and extract them, but come and share in the sense of community and the care that we give to our resources. That kind of relationship is not one I hear as much as I wish there was. And I, and It really, my ears pricked up when、uh, Siyoshi described that idea of repeat visitors. I, I would say check your facts, right? That there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff thrown around、uh, as fact and figure、um, that has, the, you know, someone cites it and no one checks it. Check the facts that you say in your own conversations about rural America before you repeat them, right? Find the source, make sure it's true.、Mm-hmm. Another thing I would say is encourage media、mm-hmm. to tell the positive stories as well as you know, the stories of distress. There's enormous innovation. We have a whole series called America's Rural Opportunity talking about amazing economic, community, social innovation happening in rural America, but those stories aren't told because they're not as, they don't get as much. Uh, shock value, right? And so、um, every time you read a bad story, look for a good one, and there are sources of those. <laughs> you can go to the Daily Yonder, you can go to the Institute for Rural Journal- Journalism, you can go to, to、uh, like some of the mainstream papers, including the New York Times and others, are telling good stories now and look for those. The other thing I would say, and I think this relates to what Seki Harasan does. Discover your connection to rural America because you have one. Right? Where are your things that are made in America made? Right?、Uh, you know, just beyond the food. The food, too, but beyond the food. I mean, the whole localism movement, you know, in the United States is about sort of connecting to the source of the product, the source of the service, who's doing the work. And so I, I would say, really, Understand, learn to understand your connection and interdependence on rural America. It's not that rural America doesn't depend also on urban, but where does urban America depend on rural? Where do you, it's your life. I mean, you know, it took me a long time to understand in my own life. My father was born in Stonega, Virginia, and grew up in Lynch, Kentucky, right? That's rural, in case you want a definition, right? My mother's from Duluth, right? 
These things, I, you know, it, I must have been in my 40s before I realized I have rural roots, right? And I have deep connections. I've now gone, I had been to Duluth many times, but I've now gone to Lynch, Kentucky. I've gone to St Stonega, Virginia, and understood where my father came from and how those communities have changed and what has changed them and wh how they got left behind and not given any other <clears throat> options, right? How we didn't really pay attention to understanding, okay, these people need new things to do, let's spend some effort on that. So the, you know, it's just understanding, you know, what is your rural connection, right? And how do you depend on rural America? That's what I would say. And probably to be repeat visitors to the conversation, outside an election cycle or its potential for one part of the country or another country to part of the country to move a particular needle uh, in any direction. So in service of conversation and in service of time, we have just a few minutes. I wonder if any of you has a, a question you really want to ask now before we retire upstairs. Caller it out. Uh, this is a question for any of you. In your travels, have you seen any great examples of communities actually deliberately trying to benefit their local ecosystem instead of simply extracting from the local ecosystem? So these are deliberate efforts to benefit trees, benefit water, benefit fish, etc. All right, I'm trying to understand the, what is your understanding, but what's the understanding upon your question? That rural communities are, are not trying to protect the ecosystems? I would say it's exactly the opposite. I would say it's exactly the opposite. And in fact, there, I mean, you know, uh, it may be that you hear about places in the West where there are big wars over this between land stewardship and, and use of, of the ecosystem. There, we did a whole uh, session in our series just a couple months ago on how um, land users and, and land preservers are coming together and coming up with compromise in order to maintain the sustainability of Western ecosystems. So, I mean, there are too many stories to tell, but I, I'm happy to talk to you more afterwards about, you know, where where you see that not happening and give you a counterexample. Do you, do you want to? Uh, maybe the only thing I could add quickly is when I worked with commercial fishing families in Louisiana, um, there was a defensive posture because the impression is that they are overfishing, they don't like turtles, um, that they are not responsible stewards of the environment. And of course, they are drawn to liberty and freedom of being out on the boats and of responsibly extracting those wild resources. And as they encountered urban dwellers, so connecting and doing direct marketing and urban to urban markets, they were stunned by this urban perception that they are incredibly irresponsible stewards of the environment and, and came to realize that they are actually environmentalists, something that they would not culturally say because of what the political connotations of it are but that they live in communities that are trying to maintain the integrity of those communities very close to fresh water and land. And I think that's the norm. I think the, the challenge is when these communities, their economy is not able to function, they're under greater pressure and there's less to rely on. Um, so maybe that is why the perception is that they're not responsible stewards. And, and if you think about agricultural land, I would say you're, you're, you get a heck of a lot more focus on the sustainability and the maintenance of that land over the long term from the local communities and from small family farmers than you do from large agribusiness. So actually the action is from the local and from the local owners. Uh, more so than from the absentee owners and the large uh, corporate agribusiness. Agribusiness. Uh, We're talking about the ecosystem. Right? Uh, 
Until about 10 years ago, they said in rural areas in Japan, they talk about the importance of preserving the ecosystem and nature. でも今あの人が減ったらですね<笑>と私の住んでいる家のそばにクマキツネタヌキ、えー、シカが出るようになりましたつまりただ人口が縮小してしただけで彼らはあっという間に復元してきました。So, due to depopulation in、uh, rural areas,、um, their population increased very swiftly. So, I'm always,、um, I was actually surprised about、uh, how they're able to just、uh, revive their population so quickly. So, I'm always surprised about how they're able to just revive their population so quickly. I almost felt、uh, ashamed that I was going to say that I was going to protect this nature because, of course,、um, nature itself innately has this way of being able to、uh, bounce back on its own. 都市の人は美しい森って言うんですけど、私たちは緑の魔物と呼んでますね。So the people from the urban area would look at the forest and then they would say, oh, what a beautiful forest. But locally we say that it is a monstrous green. <laughs> 買っても買ってもすぐ全部緑。Because no matter how much you chop all the greens that they keep on reviving, come back to life. あのも,もちろんそれを注意を払うことは生態系に注意を払うことは重要なんですけど、私たちはもっと謙虚に自然の復元力を学んだ方がいいと思います。So what I like to state is that we would we have to learn humbly about how nature is able to revitalize itself on its own. はい。Um, there is a recognition that rural places can be developed through tourism in Japan, and it, it has moved up the political roster. But that means developing hotels and de- building infrastructure that not, doesn't necessarily result in the money circulating and staying in the rural places. And these intermediaries, large hotels, may not actually get urban dwellers into rural homes where relationships are built. And, I think that's where scale and intent is so exciting about、uh, what Sakihara san is describing these repeat visitors that you have relationships with. I think we do in this country have some repeat visitors. There are lots of people who go to the same place every year to vacation, and they develop an affinity with that place. And I know community foundations, for example, that actually. Uh, seek donors you know, from people who are visitors. And there, there's also, I think, when you think of it from an economic development standpoint, I, did, I worked with the Northern Forest Center, which、uh, includes Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and part of New York, you know, the upstate part of New York that's part of the Northern Forest, last year. And they did a major, major、uh, sort of symposium of all kinds of people working on outdoor recreation. And, and part of it was to sort of say, You know, people who used to come here only to ski are now coming to do something in the summer 
but we aren't really set up to help them. And they, they've developed a, an association with our, you know, our place, and we want to give them more things to do here. So there's real opportunity in the repeat visitor. What, what is so wonderful about Sekihara-san's story is the idea of people coming and, and helping with the rice, right? And then getting their share of rice, and then having the understanding that if there's a disaster where they live in urban, they have a place they can come that will welcome them because they have a relationship. That, to me, is, is deep. And it would be wonderful, and we may need to go there as we continue to suffer the effects of climate change. Um, because, you know, coastal areas are going to change, including urban coastal areas. People are going to need places to, to run. <laughs> so I, I just, but I, I, the, the depth of that relationship, I think, is beautiful, and it would be something wonderful to cultivate here. So the repeat visitors, one thing that's different from travelers is that they definitely have a sense of belonging. How to cultivate that sense of belonging is one thing that... Um, the cultural anthropologist uh, uh, Claude Levi Strauss says that um, actually um, it's, it's easy to do research for 500 people, but 5,000 is very hard. で 500 では so he basically said that uh, when you do research with a community of 500 people, there's a sense you can actually look at the authenticity of the community. But however, with the research, the community of 5,000 people, then uh, you start looking, there's, you feel the fakeness or fa something that's fake. So I think, let's say someone who lives in New York is looking for some sort of sense of belonging to a rural area. Um, when they are exposed to the authenticity of the place, then I think that would lead them to become the repeat visitors. And uh, that would not be the case if you're exposed to f fake, fakeness. The so, talking about repeat visitors, there are about 60,000 communities in Japan. So, when we look at the 60,000 communities on the verge of extinction, let's say 5% of the population who lives in Tokyo metropolitan area would start engaging as repeat visitors, then they can survive. So, when I talk about uh, 60,000 communities, I'm talking about we can make 6,000 kunis. And that could lead to also employment of 30,000 uh, young people. So the reason that I talk about future in such context is that, for example, what I've just told you, I never even mentioned the word, word of a city congressman. So these people who work for the city government, the city congressmen, um, they don't even know how to come up with um, policy. So I call them the little brain dead. I do not intend to actually die with these people. I with these people. So I really want to create a new structure together with uh, the young CISPASIS. Mm -hmm. So 
And I want that to be that fourth political force. そ,それにはやはり王冠者がとても大事です。年の皆さん。So, therefore, Thank you.